bring your heart in sacrifice to God, give it wholly to the Almighty, renounce yourself, and all sinful inclinations, malice, hatred, pride, disobedience and self, will, envy, malevolence, malignancy, avarice, covetousness, gluttony, fornication, uncleanness, stealing, deceit, fullness, slothfulness, and others, and continually force yourself to be kind when others exasperate and offend you, to pray for your enemies, for meekness, humility, gentleness, truer benevolence, generosity, disinterestedness, abstinence, chastity, arms, giving, truth and righteousness, industry, obedience, and others. It is difficult to conquer the passions, which become as though our natural members, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, but by being continually watchful over yourself, by constant fervent prayer and abstinence, with the help of God you will be able to conquer and eradicate them. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. I reverence even two or three praying together, for in accordance with the Lord's promise he himself is in the midst of them. I reverence still more a numerous congregation. Collective prayer is speedily fulfilled, and bears much fruit when it is united, unanimous, gathered together in my name. The assiduous prayer of the church for the Apostle Peter immediately ascended before the throne of the Lord, and the Lord sent his angel to miraculously deliver Peter from the prison, whom Herod wished to destroy. The unanimous prayer of the Apostles Paul and Silas brought down upon them wonderful heavenly help from the Holy Ghost. What darkness, what madness, what infirmity, and what a terrible deadly power is sin! Gazing upon faces because they are beautiful, we inwardly commit adultery, or we hate a man because his character does not agree with ours, because he has different passions to ours, because he has not the same disposition of spirit as ours, which is often not sinless, but passionate and vicious. Is the beauty of a face a reason to commit adultery, to sin? Should it not rather be a reason for praising the Creator, who hath created man so beautifully? Is the fact of a man's character or temper not agreeing with ours, of his not showing much indulgence to our pride and in general to our passions, of his not having the same disposition of spirit as ours, a reason for us to hate him. Has not everybody his own free will, his own character, temperament, habits, passions, and ways? Ought we not to be indulgent to everyone, to respect everyone's personal freedom, which even the Lord himself does not violate? It is unpleasant for a proud man when it is required of him to be humble to others, for an envious man when it is required of him to wish his enemies well, for a vindictive one when forgiveness and reconciliation are required of him, for one who loves money to be reminded of paying his debts, for a glutton when he is reminded of fasting and of the salvation of his soul. But they should conquer their feelings, their passions, and joyfully fulfill that which is required of them, or which is required by the gospel, otherwise, by giving themselves up unrepentingly, irremediably to their passions, they will be eternally lost. Glory to the power of thy grace, Lord! Nothing, no effort of sin, can resist it in those who call upon it with faith. Thus, when subjected to the violence of the enemy of everything good, the devil, and tempted by passions, I made the sign of the cross upon myself, saying inwardly, Nothing can resist the power of thy grace, and the violence ceased, the trouble and oppression passed away, and were replaced by tranquility and peace. Glory to thy power, Lord! I am only the witness that I may bear witness before him of all thou tellest me. The priests will be witnesses before the Saviour on the terrible day of judgment concerning sinners, whether they repented or did not repent of these or those sins, and they who were penitent will be forgiven. But why is it necessary for God to have witnesses when he himself knows everything? As has been said, he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. For God they are not necessary, but they are necessary for us. It will be pleasant for us to see how the priests will bear witness concerning us, before the angels and men, that we repented of our sins, condemned ourselves, expressed our loathing for sin, took the firm resolution not to sin. Remember the Saviour's words to the Apostles, Ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them, or, 
his gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Grant me, Lord, grace to renounce myself, this devil that I have become by inheritance from Adam. Lord Jesus, the new Adam, change me, make a new man of me, let me be clothed in thee. Every valley and dale shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The valley and dale are humble hearts. The mountain and hill shall be brought low, that is, proud men who think highly of themselves, and despise the lowly and humble. So it is, the Lord unceasingly acts through the spirit of righteousness and mercy in the hearts of men, humbling the proud by various worldly circumstances, by maladies, losses, humiliations from other people, and exalting the humble. Flatterers are our greatest enemies. They blind our eyes, do not let us see our many defects, and thus hinder us upon the way to perfection, especially if we ourselves are self-loving and not far-seeing. This is why we must always stop those who natter us, or avoid them. Woe unto him who is surrounded by flatterers. Happy is he who is surrounded by simple, hearted people who do not hide the truth, although it may be unpleasant. For instance, when they detect his weaknesses, faults, passions, and mistakes. He that is joined to God unfailingly, and as if naturally, loves his neighbor, because his neighbor is the image of God. And if he is a Christian, then he is also a child of God, a member of Christ, the God, man, and his own member besides. For we are members one of another. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. But he who loves God is indifferent to everything earthly, to food, drink, dainties, to earthly beauty, dress, fame. For he cannot serve two masters, for his heart is joined to the Lord, he is absorbed by him, by his love for him, and in the Lord everything earthly seems to vanish for him. Every worldly charm, even his own old sinful, passionate heart vanishes, and becomes united to God in one spirit. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit, because he becomes enlightened in God, and sees the true value of all things earthly and heavenly, sees especially the vanity, the uselessness of everything earthly, the truth, the immeasurable superiority, and the eternity of spiritual blessings. He finds in God the cleansing from sins, and the holiness, peace, lightness, true freedom, and joy in the Holy Ghost which are natural to our spirit, but which we have lost. He also finds in God his natural spiritual food and drink, spiritual sweetness, spiritual raiment, shining, adorned, and white as snow, and unspeakable beauty, which will eternally enrapture him, inaccessible light which shall eternally light him, and an abode corresponding to his soul in like manner as he himself will be the abode of the Holy Trinity. Lord! Let my heart cling to Thee alone, and do not let it cling to anything earthly, for in earthly attachments there is sorrow, oppression, and torment. Let nothing earthly be dear to my heart, but grant that I may value Thee, the one Lord, above all, as well as everything heavenly, and the soul created after Thine image, immortal, reasonable, speaking, free, the breath of Thy mouth. Let nothing earthly money, food, dress, rank, signs of distinction, etc., become the idol of my heart. We must accustom ourselves to the simplest, least dainty of food, in order that the heart should not be allured by it, and even that in moderation, only for imparting strength. The Lord was crucified for us on the cross. This is the reason why it, as well as the sign of the cross, has such power. This is why it is life, giving, this is why even in the Old Testament its symbol had such great power. The pole upon which the serpent was set cured those who were bitten by serpents, the cross, traced by Moses's rod, separated the waters, Moses's hands uplifted in prayer, and forming the cross, conquered Amalek, and so on. As quickly as the pleasure of eating and drinking passes away in those sitting at table dining, for instance, so quickly shall pass, and passes away the present life, with all its pleasures, joys, sorrows, and sickness. It is like morning dew, 
vanishing at the appearance of the sun. Therefore the Christian, who is called to a heavenly country, who is only a stranger and a sojourner upon earth, ought not attach his heart to anything earthly, but should cling to God alone, the source of life, our resurrection, and the life eternal. We must not look with wonderment and malice upon the various sins, weaknesses and passions of humanity, because they form the old enticement, the infirmity of all mankind, and men themselves, by their own strength, cannot anyhow free themselves from them, and therefore a saviour of men was necessary, not an intercessor, not an angel, but the Lord himself incarnate. May he save me wholly. This is why we should despise human passions, even when directed against us, for instance, envy, malice, pride, avarice, extortion and must not be exasperated with those who are subjected to them, but must behave gently to them, and act upon them by words, persuasion, and secret prayer, as did the Lord and his saints in relation to their enemies. This is what the worldly wisdom of a Christian consists in. Strive by every means constantly to rejoice the Heavenly Father by your life, that is, by your meekness, humility, gentleness, obedience, abstinence, right judgment, love of peace, patience, mercy, sincere friendship with worthy people, kindness to everybody, cordial hospitality, universal benevolence, accuracy in business, simplicity of heart and character, and by the purity of all your thoughts. Teach and strengthen us, O God, to live in accordance with thy will, for thou art our Father, and we are thy children, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Everyone must bear in mind that every man possesses, besides his animal nature, a spiritual nature also, that as the animal nature has its requirements, the spiritual one has its own requirements too. The requirements of the animal nature are, drink, food, sleep, breath, light, clothing, warmth, whilst those of the spiritual nature are meditation, feeling, speaking, communion with God through prayer, divine service, the sacraments, instruction in the Word of God, and fellowship with our neighbor through mutual conversation, charitable help, mutual instruction and teaching. We must also bear in mind that our animal nature is temporal, transitory, perishable, whilst the spiritual one is eternal, not transitory and indestructible, that we must despise the flesh as perishable, and care for the soul, which is immortal, for its salvation, its enlightenment, its cleansing from sins, passions, and vices for its adornment with such virtues as meekness, humility, gentleness, courage, patience, submission, and obedience to God and men, purity and abstinence. Grant wisdom, O Lord, to every man that he may ever bear this in mind. O Lord! Let not thy gifts, both spiritual and material, lie idle in us and for us, grant that they may be exercised salutarily and usefully. Fulfill this in all. May the number of thy talents be increased by the personal activity of each one of us. Look upon a spiteful, proud, presumptuous man as you would upon the wind, and do not be offended at his malice, pride, and presumption, but be calm in yourself. The enemy purposely irritates you, kindling the fire of the human passions, or arousing in your heart various suspicions of an evil nature and imaginary fancies. Do not pay attention to the words of an arrogant man, but rather to their power. It often happens that words that appear harsh at first sight, do not proceed from any harshness of the heart, but only from habit. How would it be if everyone paid strict critical attention to our words, without Christian love, indulgent, sheltering, kindly, and patient? We must have died long ago. Ought a holy and chosen flock, that is, orthodox Christians, to live, as we live. Are we walking by faith, are we living soberly in expectation of the second coming of Christ, and of the terrible day of judgment? Do we tremble at the thought of everlasting torments? Do we thirst for eternal bliss? Do we not cling to this transitory life? But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation. Keep a strict watch over yourselves. Much will be required of you. Is this how those should live, who hope for the resurrection and the future life? Is this how those should live, 
who have received warning and sure testimony from the true and veritable head of their faith of the truth and certitude of future torments. How insignificant is the earth and earthly life in comparison with heaven, with Christ's eternal kingdom. And yet we attach ourselves so much to the earthly things, and are so careless of the salvation of the soul, of eternal life. Luxuries, money are worse than ordinary dust and dirt, because they sully the soul, ordinary dust only sullies the body, clothing, or room. Oh, how necessary it is to despise luxuries, money, and dress besides. Our life is incomplex, because our life is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the most incomplex eternal being, having no beginning. God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Why, then, do we seek life in men, in enjoyments, in money, in honours, in dress, etc. There is no life for the heart in these things, but only affliction, straightness, and spiritual death. Why do we forsake the fountain of living waters the Lord, and hew out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water? Why do we toss about, and trouble about trifles? Why are we so greedy after enjoyments, money, honours, dress, and various other things? All these are dead, perishable, transitory. The devil, who has the power of death, is also incomplex, and catches us in his snares, wounding us unto death, this is why we must be on our guard, and not attach ourselves to anything, so that we may not be hurt by him. Avoid such a mode of life as tends to living for carnal motives and desires only, that is, only to sleeping, eating, dressing, walking, then again, to eating, drinking, and walking. Such a mode of life at last completely kills a man's spiritual life, making him quite earthly, and a creature of the earth, whilst the Christian, even during his life on earth, ought to be heavenly. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Our Father, which art in heaven. We ought to read the word of God more frequently, pray more often at home and in church, and in every place of course more inwardly than outwardly, to meditate more often on God, the creation, the calling and predestination of man, on God's providence, the redemption, God's unspeakable love to mankind, the lives and glorious deeds of the saints, who pleased God by their manifold virtues, and on other subjects, also to fast, to examine our conscience, to repent sincerely and deeply of our sins, and so on. God's wisdom, mercy, and omnipotence may be observed above all in the fact that the Lord places each one of us in such a position, that if we wish we can bring to God the fruits of good works, and save ourselves and others, and that out of the greatest sinners he makes righteous men, obeying his grace, which leads to salvation, and wonderfully saves us from all misfortunes, rescuing us even from destruction itself. You wish others to speedily correct themselves of their faults, but do you speedily correct yourself, do you not suffer from the same, as others? Is it not through you, through your not correcting yourself, that others linger in their sins and passions? Do everything in opposition to that which the enemy suggests to you, he suggests to you to hate those who offend you must love them, bless those who curse you, and do not torment those who take away your property, but give it away willingly, when you want to laugh weep when you feel despondent endeavour to be glad, when you feel envious rejoice at the prosperity of others, when you are inclined to contradiction and disobedience immediately submit, and agree. When impure thoughts occur to you be zealous of the purity of your heart, represent to yourself the high destiny of the Christian, made godly in Christ Jesus, and remember that our members are the members of Christ, when you feel proud humble yourself, when spiteful be specially kind, when irritable preserve calmness, when avaricious be generous, when distracted immediately close your feelings to all outward things, and meditate on the one thing needful, when you feel doubt, little faith. Unbelief then especially call firm faith to your help, remind yourself of the examples of faith, or of believers in the Old and New Testaments, as well as the miracles accomplished by faith, and so on. Do thus, and do not succumb to the enemy, for all passions, partialities, and fancies are of his imagination. You will spend the festival well, to the glory of God and the salvation of your soul, if you refrain from such passions as, malice, pride, cupidity, envy, 
avarice, intemperance, slothfulness, inattention, carelessness in pleasing God, and neglect of your soul, and if you practice the virtues opposite to these sins, and other good works. You will be devoting the festival not to God, but to Satan, if you are allowed on such a day by your passions and vices. You will spend Sunday well, the day of resurrection, if with your soul you will rise from the dead to God, forsaking unrighteous acts, if you are regenerate and renewed by grace. But you will spend the day ill, fruitlessly, if you do not rid your heart of your malice, cupidity, or your attachment to earthly things, and if your soul is not inflamed by heavenly love, by the love of God, by the love of the heavenly country, and of the life that never grows old, which is prefigured by Sunday, the day of resurrection the day of the Son of Righteousness. Beggars every day pursue you, this means that God's mercy continually pursues you. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And who will flee from God's mercy? God's saints value more than any of us the great act of the redemption of mankind by God, the descent of the Son of God from heaven, His teaching, likewise His sufferings, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension into heaven, for they spent all their lives in working out their own and others' salvation, sincerely, firmly, infallibly, with their whole hearts, for the sake of their own and others' salvation, they renounced themselves, fasted, prayed, watched, wrestled, labored in deed and word with their intellect and pen. But we do not understand how to value such great acts, we are cold, distracted, heedless, and are more occupied with the visible world and of its goods, which are but smoke. I commit my whole life and everything, by which a man lives, my spiritual and bodily requirements, unto Christ my God, the Provider, the Ruler, and the Saviour, for, everything is in His hands. As for me, I have only to zealously fulfil His commandments. Do not suffer, Lord, that even for an instant I may do the will of thine and mine enemy the devil, but grant that I may continually do thy will, alone the will of my God and my King, thou alone, my true King by whom all kings reign, grant that I may ever obey thee, reverence thee truly and firmly. O come let us worship, and fall down and kneel before the Lord our Maker, serve the Lord in fear and rejoice unto him with reverence. How must we look upon the gifts of intellect, feeling and freedom. With the intellect we must learn to know God in the works of His creation, revelation, providence, and in the destinies of men, with the heart we must feel God's love, His most heavenly peace, the sweetness of His love, we must love our neighbour, sympathise with Him in joy and in sorrow, in health and in sickness, in poverty and in wealth, in distinction and in low estate, humiliation, we must use freedom, as a means, as an instrument for doing as much good as possible, and for perfecting ourselves in every virtue, so as to render unto God fruits a hundredfold. All the saints in heaven and all true Christians upon earth are one body and one spirit, this is why the prayer of believers is heard so easily and speedily and truly in heaven, and why there is so much hopefulness in calling upon the saints, but in order that our prayers should be always easily and speedily heard by the saints, we must have the same spirit as them, the spirit of faith and of love for God and our neighbour, the spirit of meekness, humility, abstinence, purity and chastity, brave, valiant. Thirsting after righteousness, the spirit of compassion, heavenly and not earthly. Consider yourself worse and more infirm than all others in spiritual respects, and despise, hate yourself for your sins, this is pious and right, and be indulgent to others, respect and love them in spite of their sins, for God's sake, who commanded us to respect and love all men, and also because they are created after his image, although they bear the wounds of sin, and because they are members of Jesus Christ. The Lord sometimes suddenly sends bountiful material gifts, such, for instance, as, money in payment for some very easy work, and thus rewards you for the expenditure you have incurred in affording help to your neighbour, in general he freely bestows upon us the bountiful gift of his mercy, in order that we should not grudge his gift to those whom he sends to us, or whom he allows to take our property, which he has given us in order that we should not be at enmity amongst ourselves, but should live in love and harmony, should our neighbour rob us of our property, even then we ought not to be disquieted, but should bear it meekly, trusting to God to punish for the offence. You know, 
but the Lord himself meekly allowed even his garments to be taken from him, and his body to be tortured upon the cross, for your sake, to teach you meekness and gentleness in all misfortunes and offences. God is good and all, goodness, and you, his image, must also be good. He is bountiful to all, and you too must be generous, and avoid avarice and grudging your neighbour anything material, perishable, as the greatest calamity and foolishness. Who ought are our idols? They are, some persons, and after these our transitory life, our mortal body full of passions and the things relating to it, food and drink, dress, ornaments, distinctions, money, house furniture, etc. When the tempter attacks you through attachments to visible things by trust in visible things, bread, money and so on, then steadfastly lift up the eyes of your heart towards the invisible and eternal, first to the invisible and eternal God, the source of our life, secondly towards the invisible life that has no ending, towards the eternal bliss of the righteous after this transitory life. When he inspires you to seek life in corruptible things you must strive after life in the incorruptible, when he attracts your eyes to the human body, disregarding its immortal soul, you must turn your mental gaze still more steadfastly upon the soul of the man, created after God's image and likeness, redeemed by the suffering and death of the Son of God upon the cross, made to inherit eternal blessings, affiliated by God, the temple of the Holy, Ghost, and the bride of the Holy, Ghost. Avoid duplicity, that is, do not let your heart be divided between attachment to God and attachment to earthly things, ye cannot serve God and mammon, cling to God alone, put your trust in him alone, for the devil, by inciting us to duplicity, seeks himself to gain possession of our heart, which, is single and indivisible. And remember, that to attach yourself to God is always good, blessed, whilst to attach yourself to the world and its blessings is evil, painful, sorrowful, oppressive, for attachment to the world is a delusion of the devil, and is his spirit. The end of everything on earth, of my body, of enjoyments, of dress, of all treasures is, destruction, corruption and disappearance, but the spirit lives for ever. May my soul remember this, and not grieve at the loss of anything temporal, perishable, but be zealous about eternal, imperishable matters, concerning God, concerning the fulfilment of his commandments, the unity of love, a peaceful condition, patience, temperance, chastity, self, denial, the heart's indifference to all earthly beauties and enjoyments, not greedy of gain, only striving to gain the Lord himself, seeking the one thing needful, endeavouring not to imitate the crafty, and not to envy those that work iniquity. Let others take away your dross, do not mind this and do not be exasperated at it. The Lord has made us his own, O, oh, highest honour and dignity. Whilst through our sins we alienate ourselves from our Master, who has given us birth by water and the Spirit. The Lord has most truly joined himself to us by his flesh and blood, which are united with his soul and divinity, whilst we, through our sins and vices, join ourselves in the closest manner to God's enemy and our own. When praying with people, we sometimes have to pierce through with our prayer as if it were the hardest wall, human souls, hardened and petrified by earthly passions, to penetrate the Egyptian darkness, the darkness of passions and worldly attachments. This is why it is sometimes difficult to pray. The simpler the people one prays with the easier it is. If God had not been incarnate upon earth, if he had not made us godly, if he had not taught us in his own person how to live, what to hope for and expect, if he had not pointed out to us another perfect and eternal life, if he had not suffered and died and risen from the dead, then we should still have had some reason to live, as we all now live, that is to mostly lead a carnal, earthly life. But, now, we ought to meditate upon higher things, and count all earthly things but dung, for, everything earthly is nothing, in comparison with heavenly things. Meanwhile, the devil, the father of lies, in spite of the Saviour's teaching and his spirit, teaches us to attach ourselves to earthly goods, and forcibly nails our sensual heart to them. The heart naturally seeks happiness, and the devil gives a false direction to this tendency, and allures it by earthly happiness, that is by riches, honours, splendour of dress, furniture, silver, equipages, 
gardens and various amusements. Give yourself up entirely to God's providence, to the Lord's will, and do not grieve at losing anything material, nor in general at the loss of visible things, do not rejoice at gain, but let your only and constant joy be to win the Lord Himself. Trust entirely in Him, He knows how to lead you safely through this present life, and to bring you to Himself, into His eternal kingdom. From want of trust in God's providence many and great afflictions proceed, despondency, murmurings, envy, avarice, love of money or the passion for amassing money and property in general, so that it may last for many years, in order to eat, drink, sleep and enjoy, from want of trust in God's providence proceed in particular afflictions such as arise, for instance, from some loss of income through our own oversight, from the loss of objects, especially valuable and necessary, as well as immoderate joy at recovering some objects, or at receiving some large income or gain, or some profitable place or employment. We, as Christians, as fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, ought to commit all our life, together with all its sorrows, sicknesses, griefs, joys, scarcities and abundance unto Christ our God. He hath showed strength with his arm, he hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath showed strength with his arm means that the Lord, through his incarnation, reigned over the enemies of our salvation, and, having conquered them by his power, and made his mother sovereign queen of heaven and earth, he hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts, that is, the devil and the powers assisting him, the spirits of evil, he conquered them on the cross, scattering their hordes. He hath put down the mighty from their seats, that is, the fallen angel, Satan, who reigned over mankind, and exalted them of low degree, that is, the mother of God, and all humble Christians. He hath filled the hungry with good things, for instance, that same most, pure, gracious lady and other saints, and the rich he hath sent empty away, that is, the demons who would have richly filled the abysses of hell with prisoners, the human souls, which were brought to the light of Christ's kingdom by the Saviour, when he descended into hell. We only call the Lord, God, but in reality we have our own gods, because we do not do the will of God, but the will and thoughts of our flesh, the will of our heart, of our passions, our gods are, our flesh, pleasures, money, dress, etc. What vanities, what foolish fancies often occupy most of us, even in sight of the highest, the most important objects of faith, in sight of the greatest holiness. For instance, when a man stands before the icons of the Lord, of the Mother of God, of an angel, of an archangel, of one or a whole assembly of saints, at home or in the temple, and, sometimes instead of prayer, instead of laying aside, at this time, in this place, all worldly cares, he casts up his accounts and reckonings, goes over his expenses and receipts, rejoices at the gain, and grieves at the loss of profits, or the failure of some undertaking, without, of course, a single thought of spiritual profit or loss, or else he thinks evil of his neighbor, exaggerating his weakness, his passions, suspecting him, envying him, judging him, or if it is in church, he looks at the faces of those, standing near him, also how they are dressed, who is nice looking, and who not, or making plans what he shall do, in what pleasure or vanity he will spend the day, and so on. And this often happens at the time when the greatest, the most heavenly sacrament of the Eucharist, that is, of the most, pure body and blood of our Lord, is being celebrated, when we ought to be holy in God, wholly occupied in meditations on the mystery accomplished for our sakes, of the redemption from sin, from the eternal curse and death, and on the mystery of our being made godly in the Lord Jesus Christ. How low we have fallen, how earthly, minded we have become, and from what does it all proceed? From inattention, and the neglect of our salvation, from attachment to temporal things, from weakness of faith, or unbelief in eternity. How is it that all nature, and everything in nature, is so wisely arranged, and moves in such wonderful order? It is because the Creator Himself directs and governs it. How is it that in the nature of man, the crown of creation, there is so much disorder? Why are there so many irregularities and deformities in his life? Because he took upon himself to direct and govern himself, 
against the will and wisdom of his Creator. Sinful man. Give yourself up wholly, all your life unto the Lord your God, and all your life will move in wise, beautiful, stately, and life, giving order, and will all become beautiful as the lives of God's saints, who gave themselves up entirely to Christ their God, and whom the Church daily offers to us, as an example to imitate. Value highly, and always preserve Christian meekness and kindness, mutual peace and love, crushing by every possible means the impulses of self, love, malice, irritability, and disturbance. Do not be disturbed and angered, when anybody tells you a falsehood to your face, or claims any unjust pretension, or speaks offensively, or boldly detects any of your weaknesses or passions, the wrongfulness of which, through yourself, love, you did not suspect. Always first coolly reflect over what your opponent says to you, as well as over your own words and conduct, and, if, upon an entirely impartial consideration of your words and actions, you find them just, then let your conscience be at rest, and do not heed the words of your adversary, either remaining silent before him, or showing him his error quietly, gently, in all kindness of heart, but should you find yourself guilty of that, which your adversary detects in you, then, putting aside self, love and pride. Ask pardon for your fault, and endeavor to correct yourself in future. We are often angry with straightforward, frank people for openly disclosing our iniquities. We ought to value such people, and forgive them, if by their bold speaking they break down our self, love. They are, in a moral sense, the surgeons who cut off, with a sharp word, the rottenness of the heart, and through arousing our self, love, they awaken, in the soul deadened by sin, a consciousness of sin and a vital reaction. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. If we do daily strive to conquer the passions, which fight against us, and to gain the kingdom of God in our heart, then the passions will tyrannically, forcibly take possession of us, will invade our soul like robbers, our attachments to earthly things will increase in proportion as our faith in heavenly blessings and love for them grows weaker and weaker, our love for God and our neighbor, will also grow weaker and weaker, we shall enjoy rest of conscience and peace of heart more and more seldom. We must struggle in the matter of the salvation of the soul, which is more precious than anything in the world, we must count everything earthly as dross, or as a phantom, a vision, and everything heavenly, above all, the Lord himself, as truth itself, eternal, most, blessed, and unchangeable. We all love life, are anxious, and strive for a happy life, and yet our life is corrupted by passions. Wherefore? Because we do not seek life where we should. To the young, and to all grown-up people. Remember, that the moral law of God continually acts in the world, in accordance with which, every good is inwardly rewarded, whilst every evil is punished. Evil is accompanied by affliction and straightness of heart, and good, by peace, joy, and expansion of the heart. This law is unchangeable, for it is the law of the unchangeable, all, holy, righteous, most, wise, and eternal God. Those who do good, or who fulfill this moral or gospel law, which is also a moral law, only the most perfect shall be infallibly rewarded by eternal life, while its transgressors, and those who have not repented of its transgression shall be punished by eternal torment. God is that which is, existing. In Him, all the saints, all reasonable and free beings are, one. As Thou, Father, art in me, and I in Thee, that they also may be one in us. I myself, am, nothing. God is everything in me, God is in all, and God is everything to all, our Father, which art in heaven. When you call in prayer upon the Lord God in three persons, remember that you are calling upon the unoriginate Father of all creatures, angels and men, that all the heavenly powers are in wonderment at you as you call upon Him, and look lovingly upon you that you are able to call with faith, love, and becoming reverence upon our and their common Father, the Almighty, Creator, and Lord, whom they love boundlessly, whom they reverence deeply. Oh, what great happiness and blessedness, what an honor, how sublime a thing it is to be able to call upon the Eternal Father. 
value continually and unchangeably this highest happiness, this blessedness which the infinite mercy of God has reserved to you, and do not forget it during the time of your prayer. God hears you, God's saints and angels hear you. I shed tears while writing these lines. Christ is all and in all, in the holy angels, in holy men, and in Christians living, or endeavouring to live wholly upon earth, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Thus, the church, God's saints, the mother of God, the angels, the prelates, the martyrs, the holy fathers, the righteous, and all holy persons, are the Saviour's body, and he himself is, their head. Our Lady, the mother of God, is, the sovereign of mental edification, that is, our Lady and all the saints are, one spirit with the Lord. So pure and holy are they, and they have the same relation to him, or the same union with him, as the members of a body to the head, and there is one spirit in them, the spirit of God, as the soul is in one body, so is the one God and Father in them. And we, as the members of the earthly church are also, one body. Our Lady, the Mother of God, is the most beautifully adorned temple of the Holy Trinity. She is, after God, the treasury of all blessings of purity, holiness of all true wisdom, the source of spiritual power and constancy. We are, one body of love. Food, drink, money, dress, houses, all earthly attributes are, nothing, whilst man is, everything, nothing is so precious as man. Man, by his soul, is immortal, whilst everything material is perishable, and ephemeral, everything material is like dust. Everything is God's, nothing is ours. Man. Esteem the dignity of man, as the image of God and in the time of his need, do not grudge him any material help. Everything, except true love, is an illusion. If a friend behaves coldly, rudely, spitefully, insolently to you, say, this is an illusion of the enemy, if a feeling of enmity, arising from your friend's coldness and insolence, disturbs you, say, this is an illusion of mine, but the truth is, that I love my friend, in spite of everything, and I do not wish to see evil in him, which is an illusion of the demon, and which is in me also. I will be indulgent to his faults, for they are in me also, we have, the same sinful nature. You say that your friend has sins and great defects. So have you. You say, that you do not love him because of such and such sins and defects. Then do not love yourself either, because you have the same sins and defects as he has. But remember, that the Lamb of God took upon himself the sins of the whole world. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant for his sins, defects, and vices? Every one to his own master standeth or falleth. But, in accordance with Christian love, you must be indulgent in every possible way to the faults of your neighbour, you must cure him of his wickedness, of his spiritual infirmity, for every coldness, every passion is an infirmity by love, kindness, meekness, humility, as you yourself would wish to receive from others, when you suffer from a similar infirmity. For who is not subject to infirmity? Whom does the most evil enemy spare? Lord! Destroy all the snares of the enemy in us. Remember what man is. He is the image of God, a child of God, a Christian, an inheritor of the kingdom, a member of Christ. We must therefore esteem every man, although he may bear in his soul the wounds of sins. The wounds, are wounds, they are made by the devil and sin, but still the image is the image of God. We must pity him for his wounds, grieve, pray for him as for ourselves, for we are all, one body. And hath made of one blood all nations. We are all partakers of that one bread. Do not pay attention to diabolical disturbances, separations, and animosities. Repeat, everything is, one. Say, we are, one. Count all worldly delights as, dross and corruption, do not love anything earthly, do not grudge anything earthly to any man, and do not nourish any animosity against him through such things. 
love aspires to rejoice the beloved, and is sparing of nothing. Lord, grant that I may see my transgressions, that I may not despise sinners, like unto myself, and may not nourish any ill, feeling in my heart against them for their sins, that I may despise myself as I deserve, as the greatest of sinners, and that I may ever feel an implacable hatred of myself, of mine own carnal man, if any man hate not. His own life he cannot be my disciple, says the Lord. God is the creator and ruler of the whole world and everything in it is, his work, the fruit of his power and wisdom. There is no need to ask anyone whether we ought to spread or propagate the glory of God, either by writing, or by word, or by good works. This we are obliged to do according to our power and possibility. We must make use of our talents. If you think much about such a simple matter, then, perhaps, the devil may suggest to you such foolishness as that you need only be inwardly active. The principal characteristic of this present, temporal life is temptation. What is sweeter than love? And yet there is not much love in us. Wherefore? We love our flesh exceedingly, and with it everything carnal, material and earthly. Let us, therefore, despise the flesh and walk by the Spirit, mortifying the works of the flesh by the Spirit. Avarice occasions a waste of love, and inspires hatred against those who deprive or rob us of our property, whilst hearty generosity arouses love for those, to whom we are liberal, forced generosity, however, also produces dislike. Avarice proceeds from, the devil, generosity from, God. He is the father of bounties. Every attachment to material things proceeds from the devil, neglect, contempt of material things and indifference to them, for the love of God, from God. Amen. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Thus the Lord's commandments are easy and light. Whilst the devil's yoke is evil, and his burden heavy. But what do we see? We transgress the Lord's commandments and fulfill those of the devil. How accursed are we! Always remember that your neighbor, whoever he may be, if he is a Christian, is a member of Christ, though he may be a sick one, but then you yourself are also sick, and you must always receive him with respect and love, converse with him heartily, entertain him, and not grudge him anything, neither food, drink, clothes, books, nor money, if he has need of them. The Lord will reward you for him. We are all his children, and he is, everything to us. We are all sinners, and the wages of sin are, misfortunes, troubles, sorrow and sickness, and, death. In order to be saved from sin, we must pray, and in order to pray, we must have faith and hope. Thus for us sinners, prayer, faith and hope, are most necessary. Prayer ought not to cease coming from the mental, and even from the outward lips of a sinner. During prayer at home and at church against the craftiness of the devil, and the distraction of your thoughts, remind yourself of the simplicity of truth, and say to yourself, simply, I believe in everything that I ask in the simplicity of my heart, and ask for everything simply, whilst all mine enemies, craftiness, blasphemies, abomination, and illusions, I renounce. Let the origin, and the foundation, and the source of all your thoughts, words, and works be humility, the consciousness of your own nothingness, and the fullness of the Godhead which hath created and filleth everything, and worketh all in all. He who is infected by pride is inclined to show contempt for everything, even for holy and divine objects, pride mentally destroys or defiles every good thought, word, act, every creation of God. It is the deadly breathing of Satan. What hinders you from fulfilling Christ's commandments the flesh and the world, that is, pleasant food and drink, which men like, in which they delight both in thought and in fact, which make the heart gross and hard, a partiality for elegant dress and adornment, or for distinctions and rewards, if the dress or adornments are made of very beautiful coloured and delicate materials, then care and anxiety arise how to avoid staining or soiling them or getting them dusty or wet, whilst care and anxiety how to please God in thought, word, 
and deed vanish and the heart lives for dress and adornment, and becomes entirely engrossed in these things, ceasing to care about God and being united to Him, if such is the case with a priest, then he neglects praying for his people, and becomes not soul, loving, but money, loving and ambitious, seeking not the men themselves, but that which appertains to them, that is, money, food, drink, their favour, their good opinion and good word, and flattering them. Therefore fight against every worldly enticement, against every material enticement that hinders you from fulfilling Christ's commandments, love God with all your heart, and care with all your strength for the salvation of your own soul, and the souls of others, be soul, loving. Remember, that the world, which rose from nothing, is indeed nothingness, and will return to nothing, for heaven and earth shall pass away, but the human soul, the breath of God, the image of the immortal King is itself immortal. Remember all this, and renounce attachments to all earthly things. Besides looking upon corruptible creatures and created things turn your eyes constantly to the Creator, who is in every creature, and who constantly looks upon you, constantly proving your heart and your thoughts. Do not cling with your heart to anything, and do not make it the God of your heart, the sole God of our heart must be the Lord, God, who created it, for our heart is His breath. Do not cleave with your whole heart unto any person, that is to any flesh, for the sole God of our heart must be the Lord, God, and to Him only must we cleave. For attachment to material things, or to flesh, is a lie, an enticement of Satan, and the will of the devil. Amen. By attaching ourselves to mere nothingness, to transitory things, what do we lose? Of what blessings do we deprive ourselves and are deprived? The Lord has told thee, my soul, that the whole visible world in comparison to thee is nothing. Therefore, count it as nothing, and see for what purpose the Creator has created thee and what He wishes to make thee. Remember how the Son of God came down upon earth, how He walked upon earth, announcing the good tidings of heavenly truth, His voluntary poverty, His miracles and prophecies, His last supper, His shame, His sufferings, death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven, and aim and aspire to heavenly bliss. True love willingly bears privations, troubles and labours, endures offences, humiliations, defects, sins, and injustices, if they do not harm others, bears patiently and meekly with the baseness and malice of others, leaving judgment to the all, seeing God, the righteous judge, and praying that he may teach those who are darkened by senseless passions. During prayer, and when reading God's Word, we must reverence every thought, every word, as the Spirit of God Himself, the Spirit of Truth. We must extirpate doubt and contempt for the Word as a poison of the spirit of falsehood, and as doubt and contempt are the fruits of self, conceit and pride, we must eradicate pride, and be like infants, lisping in their simplicity before God, like infants, who know and say only that which their parents have taught them, and who do not hear or know any suggestions different to those of their parents, and do not even wish to listen to or know them. For the Holy Ghost taught the Holy Fathers, like simple, hearted and gentle children, how to pray, to thank and praise God by means of those prayers which the Church puts into our mouths. Remember that all of us are the children of the Heavenly Father, and in the simplicity of your soul look upon all as upon the children of the Eternal Father, Holy, Most Good, Omnipresent, Omniscient, Almighty, Most Wise, Righteous, Unchangeable, providing for all and protecting all under the wings of His goodness, and live in love with all, conquering every evil in men by good. What a high dignity, honour, and happiness it is to pray for men, for this precious possession and inheritance of God. With what gladness, boldness, zeal, and love we must pray to God, the Father of mankind, for His people, redeemed unto Him by the blood of His Son. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Hear, O priests of God! To you it often happens to converse with God by means of a set form of prayer. Do not let your tongue speak falsely, your lips saying one thing and having another in your heart, or saying and not feeling what you say. If you are praying for anyone, do not let there be any diabolical craftiness and duplicity in you, 
but pray to the Almighty God, who trieth the very hearts and reins, with your heart as well as your lips. And in order that you may always pray sincerely to the Lord God, despise everything earthly, be without partiality for all the goods and delights of this seductive, corrupt, and fleeting world, food, drink, pleasures, money, dress, and various ornaments and distinctions, the comfort of your temporary abode, consider all this as dross, corruption, and water, be temperate, love God with all your heart, undividedly not only superficially or anyhow, love Him with all your mind and all your strength, and not slightly, so that nothing could tear you away from the love of God, neither sorrow, nor oppression, nor persecutions and misfortunes, nor death, nor life, nor anything else, and love your neighbour as your own self, magnanimously bearing with his faults, infirmities, errors, the outbreak of his passions. Remember it is a great matter to converse with God, who continually sees us, continually hears us, trying our hearts and reins. Do not let your heart lie, do not let it be cold towards God and your neighbour during the time of prayer for your neighbour. Remember God shall judge you for everything, for every idle or insincere word. And meanwhile the enemy from time immemorial, the father of lies, the devil, does not slumber, and endeavours to harden by every means your passionate heart and to make it insensible, false, and crafty, endeavours to drive away from your heart faith and hope in God, together with love for him and love and sympathy for your neighbour, and to occupy you solely with worldly, temporal interests. Watch, watch yourself, the thoughts of your heart, O priest of God, and do not bind yourself by worldly, carnal desires and pleasures. Let your happiness be the one God and the human soul, be soul, loving, and not money, loving or sensual. Lord, accomplish all this thyself, for without thee we can do nothing. So be it. So be it. The most merciful and bountiful Lord is everything to all and to me, a miserable sinner, and I have nothing of mine own, the renunciation of every possession. I ought to reverently thank God for everything, for the currents of air, light, water, for every mouthful of food, for clothes. Everything, even our bodies themselves, are indeed only earth and water. Amen. We are all one, and must love one another as ourselves. The selfish grudging of anything to another, and the vexation at giving, the impulse to grudge, proceed from the devil. Every attachment to earthly things is an enticement of the devil and of our own self, love. What does the Holy Church instill in us by putting in our mouths, both during prayer at home and in church, prayers addressed, not by a single person, but by all? She instills in us constant, mutual love, in order that we should always and in everything, during prayer and during worldly intercourse, love one another as our own selves, in order that we, imitating God in three persons, constituting the highest unity, should ourselves be one formed of many. That they all may be one, as Thou, Father, art in me, and I in Thee, that they also may be one in us. Common prayer on the part of all teaches us also to share earthly needs with others, so that in life also we may have everything in common and as one, that is, that mutual love should be evident in everything, and that each one should use his capacities for the good of others, not hiding his talent in the ground, that he should not be selfish and idle. If you are wise, give advice to the foolish. If you are educated, teach the ignorant. If you are strong, help the weak, if rich, help the poor. When you are praying alone, and your spirit is dejected, and you are wearied and oppressed by your loneliness, remember then, as always, that God the Trinity looks upon you with eyes brighter than the sun, also all the angels, your own guardian angel, and all the saints of God. Truly they do, for they are all one in God, and where God is, there are they also. Where the sun is, thither also are directed all its rays. Try to understand what this means. Always pray with a fervent heart, and to attain to this, never eat and drink excessively. Remember with whom you are conversing. Men very often forget with whom they are conversing during prayer, who are the witnesses of their prayer. They forget that they are conversing with the vigilant, 
and the all, seeing God, that all the heavenly powers and the saints of God are listening to their converse. If enemies surround you, and you are in spiritual distress, call immediately upon our Most Holy Lady. She is Queen in order that she may reign, by her sovereign power, over the powers that oppose us, and may mightily succor us, for we are her inheritance. We are all one, and there is one Lord for all, for the angels, for the saints, for all material worlds, and for each smallest part of them. Behold the fowls of the air. Consider the lilies of the field, if God so clothe the grass of the field. Shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, mutual love, and all these things shall be added unto you, from God. This is the most indispensable truth for you. Follow it. Set your hope in everything upon God. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Indeed, how is it possible to live as we live, as though there were no God caring for us? We think to order everything ourselves. We think to provide for ourselves, setting aside the thought of God, who careth for us all. Do not merely not care for pleasures and fine things, but do not even care for your own sinful flesh, for by the slightest attachment to all these things you anger God. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You see, therefore, that you are not to pay attention to visible things, let them be as though they did not exist, but you must pay attention to invisible things, for the former are temporal, and the latter eternal. Besides this, if you seek the invisible, then God will provide the visible for you, as he has done until now. What greatness it is for a Christian, and above all for a Christian priest, that he becomes one with Christ and God the Saviour through the Holy Sacrament. When communicating of the holy mysteries yourself, O priest, say in your heart, Come unto me, life, giver, to rescue me from the jaws of the serpent of hell, to cleanse me from the impurity of passions, to appease my troubled heart, to give life to my deadened soul, to rejoice my sorrowful, and despondent spirit. Come to feed me, starving from sinful hunger, to clothe me, naked of every virtue, to strengthen me, the infirm, to honour me, the dishonoured, to exalt me, the base, to ennoble me, the despised, to enlighten my darkened soul. Thou bestowest every blessing upon me. I thank Thee, O Most Merciful One. Our heart is like the darkened earth, the gospel is like the sun, enlightening and giving life to our hearts. May the true sun of Thy righteousness shine in in our hearts, O Lord. When I look more closely upon some of the poor, and talk with them, then I see how meek, lovable, humble, simple, hearted, truly kind, poor in body, but rich in spirit they are. They make me, I who am rough, proud, evil, scornful, irritable, crafty, cold towards God and men, envious and avaricious ashamed of myself. These are the true friends of God. And the enemy, being aware of their spiritual treasures, awakens in his servants, that is, in proud, rich men, contempt and ill, feeling towards them, and would like to wipe them off the face of the earth, as if they had no right to live and walk upon it. O, oh, friends of my God, my poor brethren! It is you who are the truly rich in spirit, whilst I am the real beggar, accursed and poor. You are worthy of sincere respect from us, who possess the blessings of this world in abundance, but who are poor and needy in virtues. Abstinence, meekness, humility, kindness, sincerity, fervour, and warmth towards God and our neighbour. Lord! Teach me to despise outward things, to turn my mental vision inwardly, and to value inward, and despise outward things. Grant that I may observe this in my relations towards the rich and powerful of this world. A miser values things, and does not value the man who requires these things, he is sparing of the things and unsparing to the man, though the man is a priceless being. He does not grudge himself anything, but he grudges giving to others, he loves himself, and does not love others. But in general everything is dross and water. 
the inexhaustible Lord is everything to all. He has subdued the whole world like dust and hay under the feet of man. Charity suffereth long that is, it does not immediately punish the one who sins, but patiently endures his lapses, teaching and correcting him, whilst the nature of malice is to immediately strike an antagonist, or to make him unhappy, pushing him to extremes. It is amazing how evil and impatient we are. If our brother has sinned, we are not sorry that he sins, we do not weep from brotherly love at his willful insanity, at his passion, but we bear malice against him, we despise him for his sins, whilst meanwhile, perhaps we ourselves are, or were, guilty of the same, and were indulgently forgiven our sins, and, only thanks to the indulgence of our superiors, have at last somehow corrected ourselves of these failings, passions, and vices, and become good for anything. If we happen to be even now guilty of the same sins, only not so gravely as our erring brother, it signifies that we too are answerable for them. How, then, can we be otherwise than indulgent to our erring brethren? Thus, in punishing others for sins and crimes, we must also remember our own weaknesses, our vices and passions, past and present, and punish our subordinates lovingly, pityingly, and patiently, and not angrily, not pitilessly, impatiently, hastily. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. It was not without reason that the Apostle placed long, suffering and mercy as the first signs of our love for our neighbour, charity suffereth long, and is kind. For every man is infirm, weak, rash, easily inclined to every sin, but at the same time he may also easily think better of it, rise up, and repent under favourable conditions, and therefore it is necessary to be patient to his infirmities and sins, as we ourselves would wish others to be indulgent to our infirmities, and, seeing them, be as though they did not see them and did not notice them. But in those cases, however, where the sin acts injuriously upon others, or when it is connected with the omission of the duties of our calling, or when it attains great dimensions, then an immediate strictness is necessary for restraining or putting a stop to it, or for removing the injurious person from the midst of well, intentioned people. Put away from among yourselves that wicked person. God did not spare for our sakes even his only begotten Son. How, then, after this can we grudge anything to our neighbour, either food, drink, clothing, or money for his various needs? The Lord gives much to some and little to others in order that we may provide for each other. The Lord has so ordered that if we willingly share the bountiful gifts of His mercy with others, then they serve to benefit our souls and bodies, by opening our hearts to the love of our neighbour, whilst our moderation in using them serves to benefit our body, which does not become satiated and overloaded by them. But if we use these gifts selfishly, avariciously, and greedily, for ourselves only, and grudge them to others, then they become injurious to our soul and body, injurious to the soul, because greediness and avarice close the heart to the love of God and our neighbour, and make us repulsive, self, lovers, increasing all our passions, and injurious to the body, because greediness produces satiety in us, and prematurely impairs our health. We ought to confess our sins more frequently, in order to strike and scourge the sins by the open avowal of them, and in order to feel a greater loathing for them. Think, man, into what misery audacious sin has cast you, and what has been done for your salvation by our Master, Christ, the Son of God, remember His incarnation, His voluntary self, extinction, His intercourse with men, His words, His miracles, how He was mocked, reviled, spat upon, scourged, buffeted, and, lastly, remember His most shameful crucifixion upon the cross, his death and burial, and his resurrection from the dead. Think what he bore to save us from everlasting torments, and what he requires from you in return, that you should give yourself up wholly to him, that you should live, not for yourself, but for him, fulfilling his commandments. Shun, therefore, everything that draws you into sin. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, crucify your flesh, with its passions and lusts, save your soul by patience, love God, and your neighbour as yourself. 
what has the Lord of our life done for us insignificant, ungrateful, and evil, natured creatures? He came down from heaven, he assumed our flesh, worked many and various miracles, he suffered, shed all his blood, died, descended into hell, bound Satan, destroyed hell, freed the prisoners bound in hell, and brought them up to heaven. He rose from the dead in order to raise us also with him. Let us fulfill his last will and testament, let us love one another, let us be diligent in fulfilling his other commandments, and let us cease offending him by our self, will and resistance. Lord, help us. We ought to be one spirit with the Lord, the spirit of holiness, the spirit of love, of goodness, meekness, long, suffering, mercy. He that has not this spirit in him is not of God. Thus I ought to be love, solely love, counting all as one that they all may be one. May it be so. Lord, help me. How will it be with us in the future life, when everything that has gratified us in this world, riches, honors, food and drink, dress, beautifully furnished dwellings, and all attractive objects how will it be, I say, when am all these things leave us, when they will all seem to us a dream, and when works of faith and virtue, of abstinence, purity, meekness, humility, mercy, patience, obedience, and others will be required of us. We ought to have the most lively spiritual union with the heavenly inhabitants, with all the saints, apostles, prophets, martyrs, prelates, venerable and righteous men, as they are all members of one single body, the Church of Christ, to which we sinners also belong, and the living head of which is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. This is why we call upon them in prayer, converse with them, thank and praise them. It is urgently necessary for all Christians to be in union with them if they desire to make Christian progress, for the saints are our friends, our guides to salvation, who pray and intercede for us. Trample the flesh underfoot, that is, its passions. Put it and everything carnal on a level with the dirt, and do not care for it. Lord, thine is the power, help us. When we count everything carnal and sinful as nothing, then the Lord will be everything to us. The Lord shall then reign in our hearts, upon the ruins of our earthly attachments. Through our attachment to the flesh, its lusts, or through excessive estimation of the flesh and of everything carnal, the devil reigns in our hearts, fulfilling his impious will, driving God's kingdom from our hearts, and destroying the work of Jesus Christ, our elevation into heaven. This is true. Despise the flesh, for it passeth away. But in the present time men of this world set all value upon the flesh and carnal things, and none on the spirit and spiritual things, such as faith and virtue. The Lord does not dwell in the heart in which reign greediness and attachment to earthly blessings, to earthly pleasures, money, etc. This is daily proved by experience. In such a heart dwell cruelty, pride, presumption, scornfulness, malice, vengeance, envy, avarice, vanity, and boastfulness, theft, deceitfulness, hypocrisy, and dissimulation, craftiness, flattery, cringing, fornication, profane speaking, violence, treachery, and perjury. We are all one through unanimity and love, and through spiritual regeneration, and the Heavenly Father is everything to all of us. Our Father, which art in heaven. We are one brotherhood, with one Spirit. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Let us understand this. We are the Church of Christ, of which the head is Christ himself, who is meek and humble, inexhaustible in his mercies to us, if only we live in mutual love. We are the flock, he is the shepherd. We are the members, he is the head. How can the members be proud of anything, when they receive everything from the head? If we are in lively, active union with the members of Christ here, if we love them in deed and in truth, then God's saints will be in lively, active union with us, and whatever we ask them they will obtain for us from Christ our God, for whose sake they sacrificed all that was dear to them. Do we who have received life from God, the life of all, bring to Him as an offering our life, the fruits of our life, as did our forefathers, the prophets, apostles, 
martyrs, prelates, venerable and righteous men, and all the saints. Do we even think of this daily? Do we not only live for ourselves? Do we live in accordance with the commandments and ordinances of the life, giver? If not, what prevents our doing so? The love of ourselves, self, love. Let us offer our self, love as a sacrifice of love to the Lord, for what are we of ourselves? Sin, corruption. You are daily asked for alms, and you ought daily to give willingly, without anger, harshness, and murmuring. You do not give your own, but you give that which belongs to God, to God's children, who bear the cross, and have scarcely where to lay their heads. You are only a steward of God's property, you are the daily servant of the least of Christ's brethren, and therefore you must fulfill your duty meekly, humbly, and unwearyingly. You will thus be serving Christ, the judge and recompenser, a great honor, a high dignity. Do good work with gladness. Money comes to you easily, without great labor, and you should distribute it easily, without thinking much about it. Your labors are generously rewarded, be generous to others. They are not rewarded in accordance with their merit, do not give to others in accordance with their merits, but for their needs sake. As a passionate man is one spirit with the devil, and this I and many others feel and experience, so a virtuous man is and remains one spirit with the Lord, and this he feels and experiences, saying, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, or, as it has been said by the Lord himself, he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him, or, again, as the Apostle said, Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you. Thus God's saints are one spirit with the Lord, likewise all those who live piously upon earth. This is a great mystery and a great honor for earth-born creatures. But, also, what shame and destruction it is to the sophistically and disobedient. They are one spirit with the devil, from whom, Christ our God, deliver us all. If the truth of something has been revealed in the Word of God, has been investigated and explained to us by the divinely enlightened mind of the saints, whom God has glorified, and has been recognized by the heart in its light and life, giving effect, then it is a great sin and diabolical pride of the intellect and heart to doubt it and to be perplexed about it. I myself am every moment a debtor to the Lord, both spiritually and bodily, spiritually through my sins, and bodily through freely receiving his material gifts, food, drink, money, clothing, air, warmth, light, and in general the various comforts of life. How, then, can it be otherwise than a happiness to me to forgive the debts of my neighbor, both spiritual and material, when the Lord forgives me the innumerable multitude of my own debts? How can I do otherwise than freely give the gifts that belong to the Lord when the Lord freely bestows upon me innumerable spiritual and material blessings, the light of the intellect and heart, peace and joy to the heart, a variety of knowledge, and everything else, down to the currents of air? It would be monstrous to do otherwise. We are all one body and members one of another, and are absolutely mutually indebted for something, as in the social body it is impossible to avoid others being indebted to us, or our being indebted to others. And it is impossible for us not to forgive each other's debts, as in the body some members naturally often live at the expense of the others, for instance, the stomach at the expense of the head, or of the hands and feet, so it is also amongst men. But the chief thing is to remember that we receive everything freely from God, that we are indebted to Him infinitely much, and that he lovingly forgives us our trespasses, on condition that we forgive them that trespass against us. Let us, therefore, willingly and heartily forgive our neighbors their trespasses against us, let us daily offer this sacrifice unto God and live in love. Let us renounce self, will and the tumult of passions, and entirely submit to the will of God. We are the image of God, and God is love. Let us, therefore, live in love, let us strive for love with all our might. Lord help us. But let us count everything earthly, food, dress, money, as dross, and do not let us anger God through this dross, by bearing ill, will or enmity against each other. 
Is it possible that we should sell our Lord for food, for money? One thing only, either God or the flesh. We cannot acknowledge two gods, we cannot serve two. The flesh dictates its own laws to us entirely opposite to the laws of God, gluttony, intemperance, trust in food, drink, money, avarice, or grudging God's gifts to our neighbor, ill will to our neighbor, through food, drink, money, contempt for him through the same heart, heartedness towards his misfortunes, and so on. What must we do, then, in order not to serve God hypocritically? We must crucify the flesh, with its passions and lusts, counting it as nothing, and everything that it values much, that it loves, pleasures, dress, money, houses, carriages, likewise as nothing, as dross, corruption, earth, as indeed they really are, but count love as the most precious thing in life, sacrificing everything to it, submitting everything to it, and neglecting everything for it. Everyone must know and believe that there is a spiritual, deadly serpent, called the devil, or Satan, condemned by the Creator to everlasting torments, that can lead away into everlasting torment those who do not believe, are unrighteous and impenitent. Everyone must know and believe that the Saviour was sent from God into the world in order to save men from the deadly shafts of this serpent, that is, from sin and everlasting death, and that this Saviour bestows upon all his saving, healing remedies against the bites of this serpent, faith, penitence, and the holy mysteries of his body and blood. There are many drops of rain, but all proceed from a single cloud, there are many rays of the sun, but all proceed from one sun, there are many leaves on a tree, but all are produced by a single tree, there are many grains of sand upon the earth, but they are all from the one same earth. There are also many men, but they all of them derive their origin from the one same Adam, and before all, from God. For what purpose does the Lord add day after day, year after year, to our existence, in order that we may gradually put away, cast aside, evil from our souls, each one his own, and acquire blessed simplicity, in order that we may become, for instance, gentle as lambs, simple as infants, in order that we may learn not to have the least attachment to earthly things, but like loving, simple children, may cling with all our hearts to God alone, and love Him with, all our hearts, all our souls, all our strength, and all our thoughts, and our neighbor as ourselves. Let us hasten, therefore, to pray to the Lord, fervently and tearfully, to grant us simplicity of heart, and let us strive by every means to cast out the evil from our souls, for instance, evil suspiciousness, malevolence, malignity, malice, pride, arrogance, boastfulness, scornfulness, impatience, despondency, despair, irascibility and irritability, tearfulness and faint-heartedness, envy, avarice, gluttony, and satiety, fornication, mental and of the heart, and actual fornication, the love of money, and in general the passion for acquisition, slothfulness, disobedience, and all the dark horde of sins. Lord, without Thee we can do nothing. Bless us Thyself in this work, and give us the victory over our enemies and our passions. So be it. Let us put away from us our spiritual short-sightedness, and let us cease concentrating all our attention upon temporal, earthly things let us foresee with our mental vision the future, everlasting life, and rise in our hearts to our heavenly country. Indeed, it is wonderful short-sightedness for the immortal soul only to look upon the present, visible things, generally relating to the senses, and flattering our carnal nature, and not contemplate the life of the world to come, the blessings which I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, but which the most merciful and the most wise God hath prepared for them that love him. Of what do we not deprive ourselves through this voluntary short-sightedness? Like flies we adhere to earthly sweets, and do not wish to rise up, to tear ourselves away from them. Blessed is he who despises the joys of this world, there shall be no end to his bliss. As in the earthly life there are poor and rich, so also in the spiritual life, in the spiritual order, there are also poor and rich. As the poor ask charity of the rich and well, too, do, and cannot live without their help, so also in the spiritual order the poor must have recourse to the spiritually rich. 
we are the spiritually poor, whilst the saints, or those who shine even in this present life by their faith and piety, are the spiritually rich. It is to them that we needy ones must have recourse. We must beg for their prayers that they may help us to become simple as infants, that they may teach us spiritual wisdom, how to conquer sins, how to love God and our neighbor. And therefore pray for me, saints of God, prophets, apostles, martyrs, prelates, venerable and righteous men, that I may become like unto you. When you pray to the Lord, represent to yourself vividly to whom you are praying. You are praying to the unoriginated, endless King of all creatures, to the All, Holy, All, Merciful, Almighty, Most, Wise Omnipresent, All, Righteous God, whom millions of millions of angels of various orders revere, whom the armies of martyrs, the companies of prophets and apostles, the assemblies of prelates, venerable and righteous men praise. When you pray to the Holy Virgin, Our Lady, also represent to yourself her unprecedented holiness, her greatness, mercy, wisdom, her helpfulness to all, and the humble worship rendered unto her by the assemblies of angels and men. We must constantly bear in remembrance and strive to live in accordance with the mystery of our redemption by Christ, His sufferings, His death on the cross, and His resurrection and ascension, and His second coming, we must honor above all the holiness of the Mother of God as the living ark and temple of the Godhead, and ask her, after the Lord Himself, for cleansing and holiness, and steadfastness in faith and love. Avoid flattery, audacity, and taking the law into your own hands. Our soul has a passion for doing this when others do something differently to what we would like them to, or do not do what we would like them to. Bear with this, think how it would be if others revenged themselves upon you immediately after you had done something not in accordance with their will, or after you had not fulfilled that which you might and ought to have done. As ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise, or keep to the rule, we forgive them that trespass against us. Man is duty personified. We must here remember that our heart, is extremely capricious, evil, and foolish. Sometimes we take a violent dislike to a person without any cause or reason, and nourish malice in our heart against him, and are ready to offend him without any cause. We must despise the natural and unjust malice of the heart, and pray to God to drive away from our heart this stench of the abyss of hell. Let us remember what we were commanded, these things I command you that ye love one another. The life of the heart is love, whilst malice and enmity against our brother are its death. The Lord keeps us on the earth in order that love for God and our neighbor may wholly penetrate our heart. This is what He expects from us all. This is, indeed, the purpose of the world's standing. My daily greatest misfortune is my sins, wounding and gnawing at my heart. But against this misfortune there is also a daily greatest, Deliverer and Saviour, Jesus Christ. He daily benefits me, invisibly, bountifully. Poor sinners! Learn to know this Saviour as I know Him, by His grace, by his gifts. You are angry with your neighbor, your brother, and say of him, he is such and such, a miser, malicious, proud, or that he has done this and that, and so on. What is that to you? He sins against God, and not against you. God is his judge, not you, unto God he shall answer for himself, not to you. Know yourself, how sinful you are yourself, what a beam you have in your own eye, how difficult it is for you to master and get the better of your own sins, how afflicted you yourself are by them, how they have ensnared you, how you wish for indulgence from others towards your own infirmities. And your brother is a man like you, therefore you must be indulgent to him as to a sinful man, similar in everything to yourself, as infirm as you, love him, then, as yourself, listening to the Lord saying, These things I command you, that ye love one another, and as you pray for yourself, that the Lord may help you to root out your own cruel and incurable passions, so pray also for your brother, that the Lord may free him from the flattery and corruption of his passions, from their darkness and oppression. We must remember that we are one sinful body, more or less infected in our members by the breathing of the common enemy, the devil, and that of ourselves, 
without God's grace, we are powerless to free ourselves from this deadly and darkening breathing, only the Holy Ghost by His breathing can drive away this demoniacal darkness of the passions, through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ's sufferings upon the cross. We must therefore humbly pray to the Lord, in the spirit of brotherly love, for all our brethren and for all people, that they may escape from the darkness of the passions and their great attractiveness, in which they delight, not knowing their destructiveness, for instance, the rich man rejoices in his wealth, the ambitious one, in his distinctions, the glutton, in his food, drink, and dainties, the malicious, in his malice, the envious, in the sufferings of the victim of his envy, and so on. As the Lord hears every word of the prayer, God, have mercy upon me, and fulfills every word, this is from experience, if only we speak from the depths of our heart, so, likewise, He hears and fulfills all the words of other prayers, even our own particular sincere prayers. O, Lord, who so graciously heareth us, glory to Thee. Ask, and it shall be given you, seek, and ye shall find, knock, and it shall be opened unto you, for every one that asketh receiveth only pray in the simplicity of your heart, and without doubting. By striking our bodily structure with sickness, the Lord crushes the old, sinful, carnal man, in order to give strength to the new man, whom we have weakened by the works of the flesh, gluttony, slothfulness, amusements, and manifold sinful attachments and passions. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Therefore, we must accept every malady with gratitude. God's saints are great through their spiritual disposition, through their faith, their firm trust in God, and their burning love to God, for whose sake they despised all earthly things. Oh, how null we are, compared to them, how unlike unto them! They are great by their great deeds of abstinence, vigilance, fasting, unceasing prayers, their diligence in studying the Word of God and in pious meditation. Oh, how unlike we are to them! How deeply we must venerate them! With what reverence we must ask for their prayers for us! But in no case must we regard them lightly, irreverently, remembering their godliness and their union with the Godhead. I thank Thee, my Lord, my Master, and my Judge, for teaching me how to pray simply to Thee, for hearing my calling upon Thee, for saving me from my sins and sorrows, and for rightly directing my ways. I called upon Thee, in the sin of my wickedness in the words of the Church prayer, O, Lord, our God, who grantest forgiveness unto men through repentance. And as soon as I finished this prayer, peace and lightness established themselves in my soul. Do not listen to the calumnies of the enemy against your neighbor, his abominations, his various wickednesses, and his pride. Look upon everybody simply, respectfully, as upon the image of God, and do not think any evil of him without reason. When you are praying either inwardly only, or both inwardly and outwardly, be firmly convinced that the Lord is there, by you and within you, and hears every word, even if only said to yourself, even when you only pray mentally, speak from your whole heart, sincerely, judge yourself likewise sincerely, without in the least justifying yourself, have faith that the Lord will have mercy upon you, and you will not remain unforgiven. This is true. It is taken from experience. You are angry with your neighbor, you despise him, do not like to speak peaceably and lovingly to him, because there is something harsh, abrupt, careless, unpleasant to you in his character, in his speech, in his manners, because he is more conscious of his dignity than perhaps is necessary, or because he may be somewhat proud and disrespectful, but you yourself, your neighbor's physician and teacher, are more guilty than him. Physician, heal thyself. Teacher, teach yourself. Your own malice is the bitterest of all evils. Is it then possible to correct malice by means of evil? Having a beam in your own eye, can you pull out the mote from the eye of another? Evil and faults are corrected by good, by love, kindness, meekness, humility, and patience. Acknowledge yourself as the greatest of sinners, of those who appear to you to be sinners, or are sinners in reality, consider yourself worse and lower than all, rest out every pride and malice against your neighbor, all impatience and fury, 
and only then try to cure others. Until then cover the sins of others with your indulgent love. What would life be if everyone were to notice all their neighbors' iniquities? Eternal animosity and discord, for who is without sin? And, therefore, we are commanded to forgive all those who trespass against us, for if the Lord will be extreme to mark our iniquities, who of us may abide before his justice? For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. We stand before the altar of love in the presence of incarnate love itself, but we have no love to each other. How strange it is! And we do not even care about this. But love will not come of itself without our zeal, efforts and activity. Lover of men, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, I thank Thee from all my heart, for having heard my prayer to love my neighbor and despise earthly things, and for having poured into my heart peaceful, reasonable and sweet love. Strengthen these in me, O God, through the prayers of our most pure Lady, Thy Mother, and may I be Thy child, O Lord, and her truest child. O, oh, how beautiful, how precious a creature is man! O, oh, what a most graceful and splendid palm, tree is man! O, oh, man is the best of God's creatures! O, oh, most honourable of God's creatures, that ought, as the image of God, as the justly, revered temple of God Himself, to be inviolable to anything impure! May all impure, evil, blasphemous thoughts, as well as all doubting thoughts, flee from us. We are the children of God, we are holy in Christ, let us keep, let us preserve our hearts in holiness, so that the hand of the impure and evil spirits may not in any way touch us, the living arcs of God, our thoughts and hearts. Word of God and God Thyself, who wast incarnate for our sakes, preserve us in Thy holiness. Our Most Holy Head. Deliver not our hearts and bodies to the impure Satan, let him not sully them by evil thoughts, but ever dwell with us and keep us pure and spotless. Grant, Lord, that as members of thy body, we may ever have living union with thee, our most divine head, union in the thoughts of our hearts, in our prayers, and in our deeds. The falling away of our hearts from thee is, darkness and death, sorrow and straightness, shame, humiliation and the spiritual abomination, whilst with thee we find, light, life, peace, joy, wide,ness of heart, boldness, greatness and holiness. You know that eternal life in God is promised you, that you must earn it by obedience to God and His Church during this transitory life, by patience in sickness, sorrows, misfortunes and various privations, and yet you do not wish to obey the Creator, you live in carelessness and neglect of your souls, in neglect of virtue, in continual sin. What can you expect after this, ungrateful, evil, natured, and disobedient creatures? My soul, think and direct all your earthly life to the glory of God and the good of your neighbor. Do not gratify flesh and blood, but seek to please your Lord, for flesh and blood are perishable like all earthly things. Why be suspicious, where there should be no suspicion? For instance, during reading and listening to the Word of God, or during the reading and singing in church, during the prayers, etc. God is truth, and that is enough, the church is the pillar and ground of truth, the devil is, falsehood itself, the calumniator, the adversary, that is enough. Know the one God and his truth, shun the devil and his lies, illusions and follies. The demons tremble at the sight and even at the sign of the life, giving cross, because the Son of God was nailed to the wood of the cross and sanctified it by his sufferings upon it, how much more do the demons tremble before Our Lady, the Mother of God, and even at her most holy name. Our Lady is like the brightest star. She is all radiant with the light, in God, she is like a glowing ember in a large fire, all, luminous and full of fire as it is easy to think that He, God, is light and holiness, so it is that she, too, is eternal light and eternal holiness. Amen. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, and to, day, and for ever, as likewise God's truth, everything that is read in the Gospel, the Holy Scriptures, 
the church prayers, the canons, the akathistos, the psalms, is the one same eternal truth, it is the same now, as when you first found it, or when you prayed with a fervent heart, and felt its full verity, its sweetness, peace and life, giving effect. You change and place yourself in various relations to it, but the truth itself remains forever the same, the eternal enlightening, warning and life, giving Son. How long will it be before the holy mysteries of which we partake remind us that, we, who are many, are one body, and how long will there be no mutual hearty union between us, as members of the single body of Christ? How long shall we make our own laws of life be inimical to each other, envy each other, torment, grieve, fret, judge and abuse each other? When will the Spirit of Christ abide in us, the Spirit of meekness, humility, kindness, love unfeigned, self-denial, patience, chastity, abstinence, simplicity and sincerity, contempt for earthly things and entire aspiration after heavenly ones. Lord Jesus Christ. Enlighten our spiritual vision and let thy loving Spirit lead us all into the land of righteousness. Give us thy Spirit. The Lord is everything to us all, for we cannot do anything of ourselves, for ourselves. He is the giver of all powers, all blessings and of everything necessary for our welfare. Let us cast all our sorrows, cares and anxiety upon the Lord. During prayer, be like a lisping infant, mingling your spirit in one with the spirit of the prayer you are pronouncing. Count yourself as nothing and accept the prayer as a great gift of God. Renounce your own carnal wisdom and do not listen to it, for carnal knowledge puffeth up, it doubts, imagines, blasphemes. If, during prayer or at any other time, the enemy hinders your soul by any kind of blasphemy or abominations, do not become despondent in consequence of them, but say firmly in your heart, it was for the cleansing from these and like sins that our Lord Jesus Christ came upon earth, it was to heal these and other like infirmities of spirit that the Most Merciful came to help us, and if you say these words with faith, your heart will be immediately at rest, for the Lord will cleanse your heart. In general, you must not fall into despondency through any sin or evil imagination, but trust in the Saviour. O, oh, boundless mercy and compassion of God! O, oh, most great service of the God, man to us sinners! And even until now He serves us in His love for men, cleansing and saving us. And therefore let the dominion of the enemy be covered with shame. By praising your pious neighbour, you praise God, by doing good to your neighbour, you do good to yourself, for we are, one body, by doing good to your neighbour, you make God your debtor, for your neighbour is the image of God, and God, is everything in all. By doing good to a Christian, you make Christ, the Son of God, your debtor, for Christians are his body, his members. By lending to a Christian, you lend to the Holy Ghost, for Christians are the temples of the Holy Ghost. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? God created man after his own image and likeness, this is an infinitely great gift, but man, a reasonably free creature, became ungrateful to his Creator, offended him by his perfidy and faithlessness, by his pride, he wished to become equal to his Creator and went against him. Every sin is a war against God. But, O oh infinite gift of God's love to men! When we had fallen so low by having sinned against the Creator, when we had fallen from life into death, by turning away from God, our life, when we had corrupted ourselves by sins, and when everlasting death threatened us, God sent upon earth the Redeemer of the world, His own only, begotten Son, in flesh like unto ours, to suffer for our offences and thus cleanse us from sins, through repentance and faith in Him, and bring us again to His Father, from whom we had fallen away. Let us value this, God's greatest benefit to us, and let us not neglect so great salvation. Let us constantly remember our sinful corruption, and the means of grace offered by the Church for our regeneration. Therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Are we new or the same as of old, with the same sins as before? The Mother of God is one flesh and blood, and one spirit with the Saviour, as his mother. 
So infinitely great was her merit by the grace of God that she became the mother of God himself, giving him most pure and most sacred flesh, nourishing him with her milk, carrying him in her arms, clothing him, caring in every way for him in his infancy, kissing him over and over again, and caressing him. O Lord, who can describe the greatness of the God, bearing virgin? Every tongue is in doubt how to worthily praise thee, even the angelic mind itself wonders how to him thee, mother of God. We must call upon her with one thought and simple impulse of the heart. She is one with God, like the saints. Know and remember, that the matter of your salvation is always near to the heart of Our Lady, the Mother of God, for it was for this that the Son of God, by the favour of the Father, and the co-operation of the Holy Ghost, chose her out of all generations and was incarnate of her in order to save the human race from sin, the curse and the eternal death, or everlasting torments. As the matter of our salvation is near to the Saviour, so likewise it is near to her. Turn to her with full faith, trust, and love. Christ, the Son of God, the Most Holy God, is not ashamed to call us sinners brethren, therefore do not at least be ashamed to call brothers and sisters poor, obscure, simple people, whether they be your relatives according to the flesh or not, do not be proud in your intercourse with them, do not despise them, for we are all actually brothers in Christ, we were all born of water and the Spirit in the baptismal font and became children of God, we are all called Christians. We are all nourished with the body and blood of the Son of God, the Saviour of the world, the sacraments of the Church are celebrated over all of us, we all pray the Lord's Prayer, our Father. And all of us equally call God our Father. We do not know any other relationship, besides the spiritual, the highest, the eternal relationship, which was given to us by the Lord of our life, the Creator, and the Regenerator of our nature, Jesus Christ, for this relationship is alone true, holy, lasting, whilst earthly relationship is untrue, changeable, inconstant, transitory, corruptible as our flesh and blood are corruptible. And therefore be simple in your intercourse with your fellow men, as an equal with equals, and do not exalt yourself above anyone, but, on the contrary, humble yourself. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Do not say, I am educated and he or she, is not, he or she, is a simple uneducated peasant, the gift of God is given to you, an unworthy one, do not turn it into an occasion for pride, but into an occasion for humility, for unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required, and to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Do not say, I am of noble birth, and he is of low birth, earthly nobility, without the nobility of faith and virtue, is, an idle name. What is there in my nobility, when I am as much a sinner as others, or perhaps even worse? And we must love our neighbour, not in our way, but in God's way, that is, not according to our will, but in accordance with the will of God. Our will is only to love those who love us, and to despise, hate, and persecute our enemies or those who are displeasing to us from some reason or other. But God desires that we should love these still more, because they are sick, so that we ourselves, being also sick with self, love, scorn and malice, should cure ourselves by love and humility, applying this same all, healing plaster also to the wounds of their hearts. In curing the spiritual maladies of others, we must not in any case be arrogant nor bear malice, nor become angry and get out of temper, nor think of our own advantage instead of our neighbours, and serve our own self, love and, in general, our own passions. Charity is not provoked by the thoughtless or arrogant behaviour of its neighbour, but suffereth long, and is kind. Vaunted not itself, is not puffed up. Thinketh no evil, does not take account of every word and screens everything. Yes, this is right, for what you screen by indulgence, often easily passes away of itself. And therefore he who strives to cure others, must himself be in good health, so that he may not be told, Physician, heal thyself. If the man, whom you strive to heal, notices that you yourself are evil, angry, and do not love him, then he will inwardly despise and hate you, 
and you will not produce any effect upon him by anything, for evil is not amended by evil, but by good. Overcome evil with good, first root out in yourself that which you wish to root out in others. Worldly cares obscure the mental horizon of our soul, like mist, they darken the spiritual vision and bind the soul. But be careful for nothing, and cast all your sorrows and anxieties upon the Lord, in accordance with the Spirit, bearing teaching of the Apostle. Do not grudge any expenses incurred for others, these are a pledge of new and greater bounties from the Lord to you. Some seem to be praying to the Lord, but are in reality serving the devil, who nestles in their hearts, because they pray only with their lips, whilst their hearts are cold, do not feel, and do not desire that which the lips ask and say, and are far from the Lord. Likewise, there are many communicants who communicate of the body and blood of Christ insincerely, not with great love, but only with their mouths and bellies, with little faith, coldly, with hearts attached to food, drink and money, or inclined to pride, malice, envy, slothfulness, and far from him who is all love, holiness perfection, great wisdom, and unspeakable goodness. It is needful for such persons to go deeper into themselves, to repent more deeply, and think profoundly of what prayer is, and what holy communion is. Coldness of heart towards God, towards prayer, proceeds from the devil, he is the coldness of hell, but let us, as children of God, love the Lord with burning love. Grant us this, our Lord, for without thee we can do nothing. For thou art, everything to us, whilst we ourselves are, nothing. Thou hast brought us from non-entity into being, and hast provided us with everything. To repent, means to feel in our hearts the falsehood, the madness, the guilt of our sins, it means, to acknowledge that we have offended, by them, our Creator, our Lord, our Father and Benefactor, who is infinitely holy, and infinitely abhors sin, it means, to desire, with the whole soul, to amend and to expiate our sins. Remind the Christian who has sinned voluntarily or involuntarily, more frequently of his dignity, that he has been made godly, and that our nature is placed upon the throne with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Tell the Jew, Mahometan, or heathen, at a fitting occasion, of what they deprive themselves by lingering in unbelief, tell them how our nature has been raised, ennobled, filled with grace by the Son of God, exhort Christians to give up sinning for the sake of this nobility of their nature and draw unbelievers to the faith of Christ. The Great Litany. In accordance with it, we are all, one. In the litany are enumerated all the members of the Church, the body of Christ, first the earthly members, and then the heavenly ones. Such is the character of all the divine services of the Russian Orthodox Church, of the Vespers, Matins, Liturgy. With what a spirit, with what elevation of the thoughts, with what love, must the priest pray to God in behalf of all, and for all. Throughout the prayers and hymns of the Church moves the Spirit of Truth. Everything contradictory and blasphemous that comes into the head, from without, proceeds from the devil, the father of lies, the calumniator, the prayers and psalms are the breathing of the Holy Ghost. He who prays to the Lord, to the Mother of God, to the angels and saints, must first of all endeavor to amend his heart, and his life, and afterwards to imitate them, as it is written, Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Those who pray to the Mother of God must imitate her humility, her unimaginable purity, submission to the will of God, for instance, when you see injustice, and her patience, those who pray to the angels must think of the higher life, and strive for spirituality, gradually laying aside all fleshliness and carnal passions, striving also after ardent love for God, and their neighbor, let those who pray to the saints imitate them in their love for God, and their contempt of the world or its vain blessings. Their prayers, abstinence, disinterestedness, patience in sickness, sorrows, and misfortunes, their love for their neighbor. Otherwise, the prayers will be as useless as beating the air. He who prays must hunger after, must ardently desire those blessings, especially the spiritual ones, the forgiveness of sins, the cleansing, the sanctification, the strengthening in virtue, 
for which he prays otherwise, it will be a useless waste of words. The same applies to thanking and praising the Lord, hunger and thirst to constantly thank and praise the Lord, for everything comes from him, everything is the gift of his goodness and mercy. The Lord, is my being, the Lord, is my deliverance from everlasting death, the Lord, is my eternal life, the Lord, is my cleansing and deliverance from a multitude of iniquities, and my sanctification. The Lord is, strength in my weakness, space in my straightness, trust in my faint, heartedness and despondency, the Lord, is a life, giving fire in my coldness, the Lord, is light in my darkness, peace in my disturbance, the Lord, is the intercessor in my temptations, He is my thinking, my desire, my activity, He is, the light of my soul and body, food, drink, and raiment, my shield, my weapons. The Lord is everything to me. My soul, love and thank the Lord constantly. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me praise His holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgiveth all thy sin, and healeth all thine infirmities, who saveth thy life from destruction, and crowneth thee with mercy and loving kindness, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things. All ye are brethren? Love one another. The church is like a great, holy family of God, in which God Himself is, the Father, the Most Holy Virgin, the Mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Mother, the angels and saints, elder brothers, and all of us, younger brothers, born of the same mother and begotten of the church in the baptismal font by the Holy Ghost. The younger brothers are naturally obliged to respect the elder, are naturally subordinate to them, and, being not yet perfect, ask the elder ones to pray to God for them, as they are God's friends, whose intercession is favorably received by the Lord. The children of the Heavenly Father have the prayer previously given to them by His Son, our Father. Lord. Thou camest to save us through faith in Thee, behold, I truly believe that Thou art my Saviour, save me. Thou camest to renew my nature, corrupted by sin, renew me, I who have corrupted myself by passions and carnal desires, renew me, both spiritually and bodily, so that I may be pure in heart and strong in body to the glory of Thy name. Thou camest to deliver us from the works of the enemy, deliver me from the works of the most evil, impure, and abominable enemy, warring in my members and inclining me, drawing me forcibly to sin. Thou camest to enlighten us, enlighten my heart, darkened by passions. Thou camest to gather together that which was scattered, gather together my thoughts, scattered by the enemy. Thou camest to strengthen us in our weakness, and said, For my strength is made perfect in weakness, and thine apostle says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me, behold I am most infirm, and without thee can do no good thing, without thee I cannot think or feel anything good, cannot wish or speak, or do anything good. I am positively powerless for any good without thee, bestow thy grace upon me, give me light and strength to think and feel good that which is, and to easily speak and do that which shall please thee. Behold, I commit all my life unto thee, Christ my God, my Saviour, my Regenerator, cleanse, sanctify, and save me. Make me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Help me, for without Thee my destruction is near and speedy at every hour. By their malice towards us, by their craftiness against us, and by their various offences against us, men are worthy of our special pity and love, as those who are sick and perishing, and who have become the tools of our most wicked enemy, the devil, who teaches us every evil, and who seeks, through beings like unto ourselves, to bring some affliction and misfortune upon us. But these afflictions and misfortunes are very, very advantageous to us, for they reveal to us the wounds of our heart, which we had not seen nor felt before. When some inward disturbance or weakness of the heart prevents your pronouncing the words of the prayers during divine service, then consider such disturbance and weakness as an illusion of the enemy, of the demon, throw aside the despondency, the faint, heartedness, and timidity, and speak concerning the name of the Lord without hurrying, calmly and intentionally louder, 
you will thus overcome your disturbance and weakness, and will obtain courage and strength. Everything is possible unto those who believe and trust. We must, struggle and conquer. Love your neighbor as yourself, for, by loving your neighbor you love yourself, whilst by hating your neighbor, you before all do harm to yourself, you before all hate your own soul. You know this by experience. O, oh, most wise, creative, and life, giving laws of the Lord! How good it is to fulfill them, although the flattery of sin makes their fulfillment difficult! How blessed is the Lord's yoke for the soul, and how light his burden, that is, his commands! If you have Christian love for your neighbor, then all heaven will love you, if you have union of spirit with your fellow, creatures, then you shall have union with God and all the dwellers of heaven, if you are merciful to your neighbor, then God and all the angels and saints will be merciful to you, if you pray for others, then all heaven will intercede for you. The Lord our God is holy, be so yourself also. You earth, born creatures, who have not purity, triumph in the fact that the most holy Virgin Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, has entirely and superabundantly attained the purity of soul and body unattainable to you, triumph in this, and pray to her, that she may teach you and your children to pass your lives in purity in this corrupt world, so full of temptations. It is because of her purity, humility, and virtues, and because she was found worthy of becoming the mother of God the Word, that, when offering the bloodless sacrifice, we offer gratitude to the Heavenly Father, and say, especially to the Most Holy. Glorious Lady, the Mother of God. That is, we offer to Thee our verbal service, glory, and thanksgiving. How corrupt I am become through sin! Anything bad, evil, impure immediately enters into my thoughts and is felt in my heart, whilst anything good, right, pure, holy, is often only thought and spoken of, and not felt. Woe unto me! For as yet evil is nearer to my heart than good. Besides this, we are at once ready to do evil as soon as it is thought of or felt, and we do it quickly and easily if we have no fear of God, whilst how to perform that which is good I find not the power within me, and the intended good work is often put off indefinitely. Pray for others as you would pray for yourself, for we are one, as the children of the Heavenly Father. The chief conditions in supplicatory prayer are, faith in God, a sincere, firm desire for those blessings for which we ask, and a disinclination or aversion for those sins of which we repent. But it often happens that we desire with the tongue and thought while the heart remains insensible, or it is as though our tongue had an aversion to the sins and not our heart, and we continue to linger in the same sins from which we daily pray to be delivered. And the prophecy of Isaiah this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honour me, but have removed their heart from me is fulfilled in us. When your heart is touched by thoughts of fornication, or impurity, evil, or blasphemy, or when thoughts of malice, envy, avarice, covetousness, gluttony, darken, wound, and oppress you, then say to yourself, with firm, heartfelt conviction, that all this is an imagination of the devil, and all such ideas and thoughts shall immediately vanish. Blessed is he that speaketh the truth from his heart. Tortured will be he who imagines or thinks of evil and sin in his heart. Tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Despise the carnal delight of sin, for it is a provocation of the perishable flesh. When a thought of doubt in the truth comes to you, say, that this thought is an illusion, whilst the truth remains, eternal truth. What am I? Upon the one side sin, an abyss of sin, all opposition to my God, the Creator and Worker of everything, deserving of every condemnation and torment, upon the other, entire poverty in every virtue and infirmity for every virtue. So deeply have I fallen and become corrupt and impotent. Without my Saviour I can do nothing in accordance with His Word and in accordance with mine own innumerable experiences. He has created me, soul and body, He has reared me, He has educated my faculties, He still continues to accomplish everything that is good within me if I do anything good, whilst I of myself am only evil. But, 
my Creator and my Redeemer, Thou hast created me, I am Thy creature, Thy servant. Direct me and fulfill Thy will through me. Grant me Thy grace, that I may entirely subdue my will to Thy will, for I cannot do this without Thy grace. Thou, my Shepherd, pasture me? Thou, my Saviour, save me. Thou, my Light, enlighten me. Thou, my Strength, strengthen me. What fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Not the slightest. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, and the Lord withdraws Himself from the heart in which such thoughts nestle. This we feel in our own selves. And therefore, in order that the Lord may unite Himself with anybody, it is necessary that that man should be perfectly free from the impurity of sin and be adorned with virtues, or that he should believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who took upon himself the sins of the whole world, that he should acknowledge his sins, should sincerely condemn them, considering them foolish, and that he should ask with all his heart to be forgiven them, firmly intending not to sin again in future. It was in this manner that all the saints were united with the Lord and became holy. How holy therefore must be Our Lady, the Mother of God, with whom God the Word Himself, the Light Everlasting, was most truly united, the true Light, which lighteneth every man that cometh into the world, whom the Holy Ghost came upon, and whom the power of the Most High overshadowed. How holy and most holy must be Our Lady, the Mother of the Lord, who became the Temple of God, not made with hands, and was entirely penetrated, in all her thoughts, feelings, words, and deeds, by the Holy Ghost, and from whose blood the Creator Himself made flesh for Himself. Truly she is most holy, firm, steadfast, immovable, unchangeable throughout all eternity in her most high, divine holiness, for the all, perfect God, who humanly became her Son, made her all, perfect by reason of her most great humility, her love of purity and the source of purity, God, her entire renunciation of the world, and her attachment with all her thoughts to the heavenly kingdom, and especially by reason of the fact that she became his mother, carried him in her womb, and afterwards in her most pure arms, nourished with her most pure milk, him who feeds all creatures, cared for him, caressed him, suffered and sorrowed for him, shed tears for him, lived her whole life for him, for him alone was wholly absorbed in his spirit and was one heart, one soul with him, one holiness with him. O highest unity of love and holiness of the most, pure Virgin Mary and her divine Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Wonderful, too, are God's saints by their entire love for the Lord, by the streams of blood and sweat they shed out of love for the Lord. O infinitely great Benefactor, my Saviour! When I represent to myself the infinite corruption of my nature by manifold sins and passions, my spirit is despondent and downcast, but as soon as I remember Thee, that Thou earnest to renew my nature, corrupted by sin, and to bestow upon my dishonour, upon my shame, the nobility of the angels, and even a still higher nobility than that of the angels, the nobility of the Son of God Himself, through faith in Thee, through regeneration by water and the Spirit, and through the communion of Thy holy sacrament. Then my spirit instantaneously rises up from its despondency, shakes off the infamy of the passions, and is wholly filled with gratitude to Thee. Glory to Thee, O infinite mercy and power, Son of God! Do not, therefore, grow despondent, sinners like unto me, but only believe in the Son of God. Sinners, esteem one another, and do not despise any sinner, for we are all sinners, and the Son of God came to save, to cleanse, and to raise all up to heaven. We forgive them that trespass against us. This means not to feel against our neighbour who has been guilty towards us, intentionally, obstinately, or unintentionally any vexation, enmity, or malice, but to forgive him his fault in all simplicity of heart, vividly representing to ourselves our own infirmities and falling into sin, and maintaining towards our guilty neighbour the same love and the same feelings of kindness which we felt towards him before his fault. What would it be if the Lord were to notice our iniquities as we do the faults of our neighbour? who could withstand? But as the Lord is long, suffering and merciful, be also long, suffering and merciful, not strictly exacting, 
but compassionate. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Do not reckon the faults of your neighbor, consider them as though they were not, as nothing. We are one body, and his body is a sinful one. What is more common and easier to us than sins? We breathe them like air. But the Lord, the head of the body of the church, is the cleansing of them. Leave everything to the head, who worketh all things in all, and hold fast to love alone, for it is the only infallible thing in our life, pure love. Do not serve the devil by the spirit of enmity, malice, hatred, do not increase evil by evil, and do not spread the kingdom of the enemy in the kingdom of Christ. Overcome evil with good. For you cannot conquer evil with evil, just as you cannot put out fire by fire, but only by water. Malice is always an imagination of the devil. Love is always God's truth and God's child. Attachment to earthly and carnal things to the oblivion of God, of the soul, proceeds from the devil, who, through attachments to earthly things, makes our heart carnal, earthly, a shameful vessel of passions, whilst it ought to be meditating upon heavenly things, to be spiritual, and the temple of the Holy Ghost. Ye cannot serve God and mammon, you cannot serve God and riches, God and the flesh, God and the world, God and earthly delights, therefore, you must rule your flesh and your heart, for this is the science of sciences, the art of arts. I am sometimes flesh, and sometimes spirit. O oh, inconstancy! O oh, ingratitude! O oh, slothfulness! O oh, long, suffering of God! But how long shall I change like the moon, or like a kaleidoscope? Lord, establish me on the rock of thy commandments. The crucified flesh reconciles itself with the Spirit and with God, whilst the flesh that is cherished, that is abundantly and daintily fed, fights hard against the Spirit and against God, and becomes wholly an abomination of sin. It does not want to pray, and, in general, rebels against God by blasphemy, for instance, and estranges itself from God. This is from experience. Therefore, they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Christ came upon earth in order to raise us up to heaven. Do we aspire to the realization of the object of our beloved Saviour's coming upon earth? Do we meditate upon heavenly things? Do we long for the heavenly kingdom? Let us ask ourselves these questions, and answer them more frequently. Do we sufficiently value the Saviour's teaching and preaching, His sufferings and death? Do we not trample upon His whole edifice by clinging to earthly instead of heavenly things? Yea, Lord! Thou alone knowest the cares, labours, and sweat of thy saints, in order to purify themselves to please thee, the Father of all. Thou alone knowest thy saints. Teach us to imitate them in our lives, so that we too may be in union with all through love. Why do the children of this world often scoff at that which is truth, light, sweetness, our life, I mean at the divine service of the Church, the Church, reading and singing, or at thy saints glorified by thee. These speak evil of those things which they know not. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and enlighten them. Love does not reflect. Love is simple. Love never mistakes. Likewise believe and trust without reflection, for faith and trust are also simple, or better, God, in whom we believe and in whom we trust, is an incomplex being, as he is also simply love. Amen. Why do we read the Akathist, to Jesus Christ and to the Mother of God? In order that we may enter into the Spirit of the Lord and that of his most, pure Mother, in order that we may recognize the greatness of the gift, which was revealed in Christ's incarnation and our redemption, and in bestowing upon us his body and blood in the Holy Sacrament, and in order that we may worthily receive this gift. The Lord is so holy, so simple in His holiness, that one single evil or impure thought deprives us of Him, of the sweet and most sweet, of the pure and most pure peace and light, of our souls. Hence it follows that the saints are all light, they are all one fragrance, like the light of the sun, like the purest air. Lord, 
grant this simple holiness to me also. The Lord, before his incarnation, let mankind experience all the bitterness of sin, all their powerlessness to eradicate it, and when all long for a deliverer, then he appeared, the most wise, all, powerful physician and helper. When men hungered and thirsted after righteousness, as it grew weaker, then the everlasting righteousness came. For all the many and various snares of the enemy, there is but one name, the devil. My soul, be persuaded of this and do not be faint-hearted, do not despond in the misfortunes occasioned by the enemy and in the storms wrought by the enemy. Thine is the power, that is, thou holdest all and everything in thy power and under thine authority, even the spirits of evil. Thine is the kingdom. Thou art king over all, even over the spirits of evil. Thine is the strength. Thou maintainest all through thy strength, and thine is the glory, for thou hast created everything for thy glory. As God is everything good to us, so the devil is every evil, every abomination of sin. A simple heart, taught by God, knows how to unite itself to God, and how to avoid every connection with the devil. It is sometimes necessary to ask a person who prays for himself, or for others, the following question in order to rouse his slumbering heart and conscience, are you in need of that for which you are apparently asking, and do you really desire to obtain it? Do you sincerely desire, for instance, amendment and holiness of life for yourself and others? There is only one God of my heart, my Lord and my God, and He is everything to me, as He is also everything to the whole world, visible and invisible, which was created by Him from nothing. Therefore, I ought not to cling to anything but to my God, I ought to part from everything that I have without regret, as from the dust which we trample under feet, and ought only to have in my heart love for God, and my brethren who are received in Christ into union with the divine nature. Ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now are we the sons of God. Whilst malice is the child of the devil, may it never, neither pride, nor self, exaltation, and envy, touch our heart, even for a single moment. It is a remarkable phenomenon in nature that, if you put a plant into a large, wide pot or tub, it grows very much at the roots, they thicken, they give out many ramifications, but the tree itself does not grow much in height, and only yields few and small leaves and flowers. But if it is planted in a small pot, then the roots are small, but the plant itself grows rapidly in height and yields beautiful leaves and flowers, if it is the nature of the plant to produce flowers. Is it not the same with man? When he lives in full liberty, in abundance and prosperity, then he grows in body and does not grow in spirit, does not bring forth fruits good works, whilst when he lives in straightness, in poverty, sickness, misfortune, and afflictions, in a word, when his animal nature is crushed, then he grows spiritually, bears flowers of virtue, ripens and brings forth rich fruits. This is why the path of those who love God is a narrow one. We all, without distinction of our different stations in life, rich and poor, high and low, educated and uneducated, are one body, and must love one another, as we love ourselves. We, being many, are one body. Love one another, commanded the Lord. We must crucify, despise ourself, loving, proud, scornful, evil, darkened, deadened, rebellious, passionate heart, which violently opposes our acting in accordance with these words in our everyday life, in our worldly relations with our neighbor we must also renounce our self, will, and follow the will of God in everything. Our heart, full of passions, loves enjoyment and tranquility, cannot endure bitterness and afflictions, and does not like anyone to disturb us in any way, for instance, by a request to do something for him. But the Lord commanded us to renounce the sinful rest of the flesh, and to be the servants of all, and himself showed us an example, for he knew no rest upon earth during his service for our salvation. The apostles were also an example of this, especially the apostle Paul. Our heart often sleeps during prayer, the outer man prays, but not the inner one. We often only flatter with our tongue during prayer. 
having put on Christ by faith and by the communion of the Holy Sacrament, I become firm and steadfast as a rock. Christ is the fullness of all blessings to me, and, above all, most sweet life, and the peace which passeth all understanding. When the flesh flourishes, the soul fades, when the flesh has full liberty, the soul is straightened, when the flesh is satiated, the soul hungers, when the flesh is adorned, the soul is deformed, when the flesh overflows with laughter, the soul is surrounded by misfortune, when the flesh is in the light, the soul is in darkness in the darkness of hell. Modern, false education estranges from the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world, and does not approach it. But without Christ all education is vanity. Our old man, with the old works of the devil, is constantly present with us, and acts mortally within us. This is why we occupy ourselves in the pulpit with this old man and his works, in order that all who hear us may learn to know themselves and the enticement of the passions, and, with the help of God's grace, may slay the old man within them, while we do not occupy ourselves with the news of this world, as it does not concern us. Thus we teach all to know God, to love Him with the whole heart, and to love their neighbor as themselves. And as self, love is incompatible with love for God and our neighbor, we teach men, in accordance with the precepts of the Saviour, to renounce themselves, and to crucify the flesh, with its passions and lusts. This is an old discourse, but yet it may be a new one, according to how it is turned, whether the preacher directs it against the human passions and lusts of the present day, or speaks in general, without special indication, of the necessity of crucifying the old man. Blasphemy against holiness, or thoughts of carnal impurity, proceed from the devil. When this stink from the abyss of hell disturbs and suffocates you, only be convinced, only believe sincerely, that it is the work of the devil, and this abomination will leave you. May the Lord enlighten and strengthen us. The history of the choosing and the rejection of the Hebrews shows the truth, that God shall exalt and honor those who are faithful to him, and shall abase and reject the ungrateful. It also shows the truth that he is faithful in his promises and threats. He who has adorned the heavens with stars, could he not still more beautifully adorn his mental heaven, the most pure virgin, his mother? He who has adorned the earth with various and many, colored flowers, and poured fragrance upon it, could he not adorn his earthly mother with all the various flowers of virtues, making her fragrant with all spiritual perfumes? Truly he could and Our Lady has become heaven and the temple of the Godhead, adorned with all beauties, and more fragrant than all earthly perfumes. Oh, if God in His mercy, through the prayers of His most pure Mother, would adorn me, disfigured by sin, if He would make me, the unclean, fragrant. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Adam became so proud that he wished to become God and died for his pride, the Son of God humbled himself unto death, and gave life to the fallen. O oh, abyss of humility! Adam and Eve lost themselves through gluttony, the Lord fasted and died for them, in order to give them life. They were disobedient, Christ fulfilled obedience. Having seen the wonderful birth of Christ, let us shun this vain world and set our minds upon godly things. God came down from heaven in order to raise us up to heaven, whilst the devil and the flesh drag us down to earth. Christ calls and draws us to the life eternal, whilst the devil allows us by the temporal life, and attaches us to temporal things, concealing the eternal in darkness, or making men disbelieve in eternal life. Observe his snares, and do not be allured by the earthly life. Man, in his present state, is wholly permeated with pride, wickedness, unbelief, doubt, incredulity, disobedience, heedlessness, malice, fornication, envy, covetousness, avarice, slothfulness, sometimes cowardice, despondency, theft, falsehood, and blasphemy. What a great labor lies before every Christian man to cleanse himself from all the impurity and corruption of the passions. The devil generally enters into us through one single lying imagination, or through a single false thought and sinful desire of the flesh, 
and afterwards he works in us and disturbs us, so in complexes he cannot, therefore, the Lord of all spirits enter into us through one single thought and through true and holy love, and abide with us, and be everything to us. And therefore pray undoubtingly, that is simply, in the simplicity of your heart, without a doubt, it ought to be as easy to pray as to think. Leave all human injustices to the Lord, for God is the judge, but as to yourself, be diligent in loving everybody with a pure heart, and remember that you yourself are a great sinner and in need of God's mercy. But in order to deserve God's mercy, we must forgive others in every way. So be it. So be it. The Lord is everything to all, He is the judge as well as the generous giver of gifts, and mercy and the cleansing from sins and the light, the peace, the joy and the strength of the heart. Grant, Lord, that I may ever love each of my neighbours as myself, and not be angry with them for any cause, and not serve the devil in this way. Grant that I may crucify myself, love, pride, covetousness, incredulity, and other passions. Let mutual love be our name, grant that we may believe and trust that the Lord is everything to us all, that we may not be careful nor anxious for anything, that Thou, our God, may truly be the sole God of our heart and nothing besides Thee. Let there be union of love between us as there ought to be, and let everything that divides us from each other, and prevents us from loving one another, be despised by us, like the dust trampled underfoot. So be it. So be it. If God has given us Himself, if He abides in us and we in Him, according to His own true words, then what will He not give me, what will He spare for me, of what will He deprive me, how can He forsake me? The Lord is my shepherd, therefore can I lack nothing. Shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And therefore, my soul, be perfectly at rest and know nothing but love. These things I command you, that ye love one another.